Good morning. Welcome as we gather. Big welcome to those of you who are joining us in the fellowship hall or online. I invite you to send the blue friendship books down, put your name and other information there, and then uh, send them back to the center, if you would. I invite you to look at your green insert. There will be a number of pieces of information there. Today is our Called to Serve Ministry Fair. And so directly after this service, we invite you into the fellowship hall for a few minutes. Look around at various tables. Each table has a drawing for some prize at that table. And that drawing will happen at 1010. Um, I don't think you need to be present to win but you do need to grab a ticket from that table. This Saturday, what do I want you to do with your clocks? Yeah, do, do the back thing. And then we are looking for anyone interested in hosting Michael and Carmen Zugby. They are going to be with us on the 13th of um, November. And um, they are coming in from... Uh, Bethlehem, we heard last night that they are going to be needing a place to stay. They are the people that supply us with our olive wood from the Holy Land. So if that is possible, um, please let our office know. Jacob. Well, good morning. I'll also be referencing your green bulletin insert to go over some of the things that we have going on this week. As per usual, immediately following service at 9.30, from about 9.30 to 10.15, we have Sunday school. The middle schoolers and high schoolers will be with me in my office, and then the young students are with our teacher, Mrs. Maureen, and they'll be in the classrooms right next to the fellowship hall. Tonight we have youth group from 6 to 7.30, and then on Wednesday we have confirmation class from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. After my children's message in the second service, I invite all the students who are ages three to seven to follow me back into that same Sunday school classroom for what we call wiggle worship. They will be returned to their families uh, just around the offering time. As Pastor Ken uh, mentioned, today is our call to serve ministry fair. And so if you feel called or led to serve in the areas of youth family or education, specifically if you like to work with younger students or if you'd like to work with middle schoolers or high school students, uh, then maybe stop by that table, get a little bit more information, and then as per usual, if you have any questions in regards to youth, family, or education, you can see me after service as well. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Yesterday, or, or last week, was our new member reception, and um, we had a family who was not able to be there, so I would like to introduce to you the Bensons. You guys want to stand, if you would? Um, Steve and daughter Mary, Lana can't be here today, and um, don't tell me, Peter and ah, April are, are out of town. And so um, where is Christine Makowski? Do you see there, Christine there? You guys live on the same street, okay? And so uh, if you, uh, I'm not gonna tell them exactly where you live, but <laughs> if, if you go down Powers and turn on uh, Stetson Hills, uh, they're in that neighborhood, okay? So please uh, give them a round of applause. If you look in the middle of that uh, little booklet that you've got, joining Jesus class as a family here in the sanctuary this morning, our mission trip meeting that will, uh, will be happening this Wednesday. Anyone interested, do check that out. Mom's group, there will be horseback riding for kids on Saturday this week. And then please notice Project Operation Christmas Child. Uh, you can still participate in that. Next Sunday, we start a new adult class, Healthy Parenting from a Biblical Perspective. That'll be from here in this class. Uh, we have a guest speaker. We're going to hear about one of our social ministry uh, ministries that we support called Food for the Poor. And then also there will be a fundraiser for our playground. Please notice details. Uh, if you have children or grandchildren, this might be a chance for you to pick up something for Christmas for them. 
Jacob's Going Away Party will be next week, uh, 4 to 6 in the afternoon here. Please notice details. And um, notice any other, well, the quilt drawing from our quilters will be next week also. Bob Usman. There he is. Bob, come on up. Um, our stewardship committee uh, each week for these five weeks are sharing a bit with us. And uh, Bob's got a story I think you'll appreciate. So, um, I have, have you ever heard the term God sighting? You see something, you go, that's a God sighting. Uh, so, I, the pastor wanted me to relate, relate a story. Last year in, um, let's see, it would have been 20, no, two years ago in 2021, going into 2022, uh, my wife and I gave our pledge, which in your, um, in your mailboxes are your pledge card and just a number of information on stewardship, and we had committed to a certain amount of money we were going to give to the church. So, because I need to be consistent, I give through an automatic giving program. So, somewhere during the year, I had been playing around with our bank account, and I had taken the amount of money that we were going to give in our offering, our weekly offering, and I had changed it from weekly to bi-weekly, but I didn't realize it. So, at the end of the year, I got our statement from the church, and it was a lot less than what I had projected. And I thought, that's strange. So I went back and I looked and I realized I had made this mistake. So my wife and I looked at the difference and said, ooh, ooh. <laughs> but we made a commitment to ourselves and to the church and to God. We said, we've got to write a check and we've got to pay this difference. It was our commitment. So we wrote the check. And it wasn't a ton of money, but it was a moderate amount of money. Two weeks went by and I got a phone call from my office. And they said, Bob, we, have, we mispaid you last year. And I thought, oh no, I owe them money. She goes, no, we underpaid you. And I went, oh. And she said, we owe you this amount of money. And what struck me right away was, it was 10 times the amount of what I had written the church for. And I went, <clears throat> ooh, ooh. <laughs> I said, is that a coincidence? And I said, it can't be, for two reasons. One, how many of you have had your employer call you at the end of the year and go, hey, we owe you money? <laughs> but number two, it was almost to the penny, 10 times what we had written the check for two weeks before. And I said, that's a God sighting. That's more than a coincidence. And so as I was thinking this morning about telling this story, I thought, you know, whenever you give, you, never, you shouldn't give as a con contractual giving. You should give because you want to give, joyful giving. But think about how many times you've given and how much payback you've just received because of it. Now, that's this, my example is very dramatic, but think about that during the stewardship season, about how you give, not contractually, but because you want to give, but think about all the benefits that come from that. So, that's my story. Thank you, Bob. And I'm sticking to it. You stick to it, absolutely. <laughs> I invite you to turn to page 509 as we uh, celebrate this Reformation Sunday. Please stand. Forever to spread his 
light from age to age shall be our chief endeavor. Through life it guides our way, in death it is our stay. Lord, grant that thou shalt last your church may hold it fast while Just a taste, we'll sing a mighty fortress at the end of the service. Please turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 138. After our greeting, turn the page. We will sing the hymn of praise. Please notice we divide men and women on the verses. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Victory for our God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Almighty God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your word, protect and comfort them in all temptations, defend them against all their enemies, and bestow on the church your saving grace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite the children forward. I think they're hiding. <laughs> Come on up, man. How you doing, bud? 
Ryan, before I get started in my children's message, I want to say thank you for being a faithful attender of the children's messages for all these years. As many of you know, most of our students, our younger students, attend the second service, but lo and behold, every Sunday, <laughs> Brian and I get to hang out for just a couple minutes together. So I brought with me, you know what this is? It is a compass. Very good. A compass has a lot of uses, and it can have a lot of meanings. A compass helps us when we don't know our way. I cannot tell you how many times my panic has been subsided, has gone away, by such a small little device. Knowing that maybe I took a wrong step here and I'm back on the right path. A compass also serves to make sure that we know we're on the right path. Maybe we don't take a step off. Maybe we're actually following the right path. This helps us when we're hiking and doing things like that. In our spiritual life, God has actually gifted us several compasses to help us make sure that we are on the right path as well. Things like coming to church, which you're doing great at. That might be the first thing. We come, we listen to the choir, we sing songs that place our heart in the right place before the Lord. We listen to services, we listen to sermons we do scripture readings together, and that's the second thing that God gives us. He gives us the Bible to read, to walk through. And since you're in my confirmation class, you know that we tend spend a lot of time going through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because that's how important God's Word is to us. We find out what it means to have a good life. We find out how we're supposed to treat other people. And finally, God gives us a very special gift in prayer. We have the ability, the gift, to come before the Lord, to talk to Him, to have a relationship with Him. And above anything else, when we are walking through life and we do all this kind of crazy stuff with our compass, maybe we go the wrong direction or maybe we stop looking at the compass for a little while, God cares about us and loves us so much that He is right here, willing to be with us and walk through it with us every step of the way. So let's spend some time right now and let's pray. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for mom and for dad, for grandpa and grandma. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us that keep our feet on the right path. And thank you most that you love us so much that even when we may not follow the compass or pay attention, you are still there for us. You still care for us. And you still lead us in the right direction, too. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. The first lesson today is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The second lesson is from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, 
We ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. To this end, we always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So thank you, uh, many of you who are wearing red today. If you haven't, please notice that you do have those red hymnals, so you are fine. The red today is for what? Reformation Sunday. The Reformation started because there was a person named Martin Luther who had grown up all his life believing what everyone else believed. And that was it's our job to climb up to God. That if you've prayed hard enough, if you've been good enough, if you go to church enough, if you're honest enough, if you're nice enough, then you'll make it step by step. And then finally there you'll be with the Lord. Luther discovered it wasn't that simple. In fact, it wasn't even true. No matter how hard he tried, he always found that he failed. An angry word, a selfish thought, he read the Bible for the first time in his 20s, and he discovered that he was not alone. He read, all people have fallen short of the glory of God. But he also read more and more that he saw in scriptures that it's not by what we do, but it's because of what God has done. We don't find God he finds us. It's not that we climb to God, but that God climbs down to us. And we see it most clearly in the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the basis of the reshaping or the reforming, the reformation of the church. And we see it in our lesson today. We see the 
reformation of Zacchaeus. You might want to look at your reading. Jesus is going to Jericho. What do you know about Jericho? Some about the wall. <clears throat> it's the oldest city in the world. Goes back thousands, thousands of years. One of, it, it's the earliest city. It's also the lowest in elevation. It also is called the city of palms. I have a uh, large picture of Jericho, and so we put it on the glass from the narthex into the office. You might take a look at that. City of Palms. Well, Jesus is going to and through that city, and there is a man there named who? Zacchaeus. What is he as a job? He is a tax collector. Now, from last week, what do you know about tax collectors? Are they up and up? No, that's not necessarily true of today, even though sometimes you wish to think that. But in Jesus' day, tax collectors were, <coughs> let's say, not trustworthy. We talked about that last week. They would buy the right to collect taxes, <clears throat> and then they could choose whatever they wanted to charge you. And my hunch is they often overcharge. Do you remember the other thing about tax collectors? They worked for the Romans, therefore they were... What is it? Enemy. Enemy. Traitors. So here's an abusive traitor. Are you going to like him? No. What's more, what kind of a tax collector is Zacchaeus? He's the chief tax collector. He's the high muckety-muck. He's the top dog. He is the top of the, what do they call that pyramid thing? Pyramid scheme. He buys the whole city, and then he sells the different districts to other people, tax collectors. And so because he is the chief collector, chief tax collector, he is also what? Rich. So he hears that Jesus is in town. He's coming into town, and he wants to see him. Who is this guy? He's so famous. But he can't get near him on account of the big what? Crowd. And the fact that he is, we call that vertically challenged. He is short, there's a crowd. So why doesn't Zacchaeus simply wiggle through the crowd and get close to Jesus? He's afraid of the crowd. Because if he gets into that crowd in the jostling, he might be punched, he might be stabbed, because people hate him. So, what does he do? <clears throat> Finds a tree. What kind of tree? A sycamore tree. There are still sycamore trees in uh, Jericho, and they will tell you that this tree is the very one that Zacchaeus <laughs> climbed. No, but like it. He climbs that sycamore tree so that he can see above the crowd and see Jesus. Now, as Jesus approaches that tree, he notices Zacchaeus. Now, what is it that draws Jesus' attention so that he notices Zacchaeus? It's not mentioned, but I'm sure of it. The crowd, the front part of the crowd, has already gotten to the tree. They know he's there. This week, I was outside in our backyard and I heard a terrible racket made by the crows. There had to be 20 crows and various other birds cawing and screeching in one place. Why? What? Yes. It's taken me 32 years to discover whenever that happens, it's a bird of prey, an enemy, an intruder of the crows, and so they get together in this big group and they cause a ruckus. And what they're trying to do is scare away the hawk, the owl, or whatever that bird of prey is. And sure enough, I went out there and I was looking carefully, couldn't see that hawk as it turned out, but finally I saw it fly away. The cacophony, the racket that these things put up is crazy and it finally drives that larger bird away. Think of the same kind of picture. 
The crowd is there, they're moving past the tree. Someone notices Zacchaeus and they start to torment him. And Jesus looks up and sees him. Think for a moment, if you were the crowd and you see Zacchaeus up there, do you like him? Do you want him up in the tree? Well, it's kind of like a cat up in the tree, he's caught. Now you know where he is and he's vulnerable. Maybe some kids start climbing the tree and tugging on his robe. Other people are starting to yell at him, jeer at him. Zacchaeus is in danger. And so as Jesus looks up, he says, Zacchaeus, and in your reading, what's the first, what's the next word? Hurry. Hurry. Now, unless Zacchaeus is in danger, there's no reason to hurry. But Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry on down, for I'm going to be a guest at your house. Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm here. Jesus saves Zacchaeus. And in doing so, Zacchaeus begins to consider his own life. Wow, this guy who everybody knows all of a sudden not only notices me, but cares enough to be my cover. And he even chooses to come and be a guest at my table. Jesus saves Zacchaeus from a dangerous and maybe deadly situation. Jesus diffuses the situation. Come on down, I'm going to be at your house. And everybody else goes, whoa, uh, I guess that's what he's doing. Their response is interesting. He has gone, Jesus has gone to be the guest at the house of a sinner. And in fact, that's exactly what Jesus always does, isn't it? Luther says, Jesus saves sinners and nothing but sinners. He can't save us unless we recognize we are one, that we also have fallen short. The crowd, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus is lowering himself to the level of Zacchaeus, the traitor. He's stooping down to join the lowest of the low. He's gone to stay at the house of a sinner. And so in doing so, Jesus saves Zacchaeus from an unruly crowd and also from himself. Why does Jesus do it? Why does he save Zacchaeus? Is it because Zacchaeus is so good? Of course not. It's because Jesus is so good. No, this dirty, rotten cheat, Jesus willing to give his life even for Zacchaeus. And if God can save one like Zacchaeus, then he certainly can save one like you. This is what Luther discovered. It's why we celebrate this Reformation Sunday. That the world talks about the way to get ahead, the way to be worth something is to earn it. To be good enough, small enough, smart enough, tall enough, strong enough, cute enough, thin enough, nice enough. And if you're enough, then you make it. But in God's economy, it's backwards. We often think, well, if we're good enough for God, kind enough, if we're loving enough or compassionate enough, then we'll make it. How often do you hear someone say, well, I think, I think I'm probably good enough for heaven. But we don't climb to God. He climbs down to us. What do we hear in Scripture? All we like sheep have gone astray, each to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the sin of us all.
Jesus saves Zacchaeus from the crowd. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' house to eat with him, which means, I accept you. I care about you. And that move has a huge impact on Zacchaeus. Now picture Zacchaeus walking along now from the tree toward his house with Jesus. Who else is with Jesus? Always. Twelve disciples. All right, now we've got 14 people at the table. But do you for an instant think that Zacchaeus, who's such an important, if not nasty, person, is going to simply limit it to the 14? I'm thinking as he's walking to his house, he sees a neighbor, he says, come along, come and meet Jesus. He's got some friends, he's got some cronies. Pretty soon he's got a small crowd of his own and they come to his, I'm sure, fairly large home and they sit down and begin to talk as the meal is prepared. Surrounded by his friends, after the meal has been completed, Zacchaeus stands to make a speech. He says, half my goods, Lord, I give to the poor. Now, it's clear that Zacchaeus has some territory to make up. I don't think he's probably been very generous. The biblical goal is 10%. But Zacchaeus says 50%. It's been quite a while. I need to be making up for lost time. All of his life has been about him, and now he realizes life is about others. Half my goods, Lord, I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, do you know what defraud means? Cheat, overcharge. And of course, his friends have to snicker at that. If. Well, that's what you've been about the whole time. And Zacchaeus, I can see, nodding and smiling and says, I know, you are right. If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will repay them. Now, the biblical directive, if someone has cheated or stolen something, you return to them what is theirs plus 20%. And what does Zacchaeus say? If I have done this to anyone, it will be what percent? 400%. Just idle talk? Is he flapping his lips? Is he making a promise he won't keep? Just remember, his neighbors and friends are all around him and they're going to hold him accountable. Zacchaeus has become a new man and we hear it in what Jesus says to him. Today, now, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Zacchaeus' story isn't just one for long ago. It's your story and mine. That we don't climb up to God if we're nice enough, big enough, rich enough, loving enough. He always is climbing down to us in Jesus Christ and finding us in the lowest, hardest, most difficult, struggling places. In our pain, in our failures, in our shame, he comes down to our homes, our lives, our hearts, to restore and to heal and make new. And as he does, we learn to say and sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We sing.
I invite you to turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 105. Next week it's 104. For the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you never give up on us, that no matter how far we stray, no matter how dark the time, like a good shepherd, you do not fail to seek us out, and you search until you find us, and then you put us on your shoulders, and rejoicing, you carry us home. Lord, thank you for your forgiving love. Continue to direct and guide us every thought, every decision, every word or action that you might reform us and make us more like you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who have been abused cheated, used, and find themselves in a position that is unfair and difficult. You are the seeker of the lost, not only those who have been the abuser, but also those who have received. Work to heal and to restore that we may know your goodness and being made whole, we may share such goodness with one another. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our world torn, difficult, hurting, suffering, especially for Europe, Ukraine, and other countries. We pray for your peace. Lord, in your mercy. For our missionary, Didi and Serafina, we continue to lift them up, strengthen Serafina as she heals, continue to guide and direct Didi as he is already back serving in the Congo of Africa. Lord, in your mercy. And hear us as we name those in our midst who yearn for your presence and your healing. Electa, Dorothy, Jean and Haldi, Don, Tom, Duane, and those we mention silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share God's peace with one another.
Our offering prayer is printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with God through the one who gave himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give us thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with a church on earth, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of What does it mean? Save us. Like he saved Zacchaeus, save us. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy, eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have life eternal. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to them all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. As you come to the Lord the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, 
the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Peace be to God.